feels like Friday afternoon, doesn't it? Uh, so today's talk is going to be very different from the previous four talks. It's going to be more about my actual research interests and um, and particularly the role that multi-missionary astronomy uh, plays in, in gravitational wave astronomy. I think it's, it's valid to have a presentation about that um, because it, after all, this is a workshop on uh, challenges in cosmology and gravitational waves. And I think uh, it would be good to have a review why, what is multi-missionary astronomy first and why it's so important um, as a tool to do gravitational wave astronomy, to do gravitational wave astrophysics. So we we saw through out the class, uh, the, or the workshop, sorry, that um, essentially the astrophysical sources that emit transient gravitational wave signals that are detectable by LIGO and uh, in, in and Virgo in 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 their in their band. It goes between 10 and 1,000 uh, hertz, and, and it essentially are the coalescence of binary uh, systems of either neutron stars or black holes or neutron star black holes. And um, so the other uh, one would be uh, the core collapse of massive stars or supernova. Um, although the reach of the detectors in its present incarnation um, probably won't have much chances of detecting a supernova, but it could happen. Uh, actually, if you look at the rates that are predictable for supernova in our galaxy, uh, it's bound to happen almost any minute, uh, a supernova in our galaxy. The last one was in Kepler's time, so 500 years ago, and, and this emitted rate great per galaxy is about 500 years, one second of 500 years. And that would be very cool. Uh, the problem with LIGO Virgo is, is that they don't have a reach much beyond the, the, um, our, our galaxy. And of course, isolated neutron stars that give rise to continuous gravitational waves. So, uh, oh, uh, one, one thing that I didn't, I didn't mention, and it probably would have been important to mention, is uh, these particular searches uh, are model searches, so we use a much filtered technique. Uh, that you probably learn in, in the data analysis uh, lessons, and while these other ones are more a model searches. So during 01 and 02, there were sent uh, 17 alerts. 01 and 02 refer to the two scientific observational campaigns sustained by LIGO and Vigo. 01 was the first one between uh, roughly September 2015 uh, and the beginning of 2016. And the second one uh, was from uh, uh, near the end of 2016 and through the end of August 2017. And um, at, at the time, there were all eight confident detections. We know now they're actually a bit more. And this is, is um, this, this, what, what this is is essentially a sky map, and the reason why I want to show a sky map here is because it shows the area of uh, probability of localization of the source with some percentage of probability um, because the gravitational wave detectors are a lot like a sticking your ear to the ground and listening, so they're very poor uh, in terms of localizing the position of the source. You can do it by triangulation with three detectors, but even in, in those cases, um, the probability of localization covers hundreds and even thousands of square degrees, so big chunks of the sky, which is what you can see here. And uh, so as a result of 01 and 02, we have well-established 11 detections, 10 of binary black holes and one of binary neutron star merger. So here is uh, this can only be interpreted uh, as one relevant parameter given the masses of the uh, participating black holes and, and the end result. And um, while the black holes are being compared with pretty much all the known bla 
black holes, and we know those black holes pretty much only in our galaxy because they are part of uh, what are called X-ray binaries, and we infer from uh, stellar companion the existence of the black holes. There's an indirect evidence of the black holes. Um, these are only a few of the neutron stars. There are many more uh, uh, neutron stars that we know in our galaxy, and a few that we know outside the galaxy. And so a very important problem is the localization of the sources. As you can see, um, the localization gives a 90% probability. Uh, the 90% probability is the smallest, uh, sorry, the largest region. That, that one is, uh, uh, is the smaller region, it has a, a lower probability. So the 90% probability is the larger region that looks like bananas on, on this sky map. The only situation in which uh, there was a, a very good localization is this one, because this one is particularly was obtained through three detectors. Most of the ones that you see here, they were um, only two detectors. This one is uh, through uh, both LIGO and Virgo, this one also, and this one, it was the first one uh, that was localized using three detectors. So you can see as, as you add detectors to the network, uh, the precision improves uh, in a notable way. So why multi-messenger astronomy? Well, multi-messenger astronomy means using gravitational waves, typically as a trigger. It could be the other way around. You can use the detection of a short gamma ray burst, and if you have data taken by the detector during that time, try to see if there is a match. But I, in, in this uh, talk, I'm going to refer to to the previous model, the model in which um, LIGO and Virgo uh, send to the community of astronomers, um, an alert, and and then um, with all sort of, of uh, observatories, including particles like, for example, neutrino observatories or cosmic rays observatories, and um, follow up the astronomer follow up the event. So through the gravitational waves, the information that we extract are about the mass, the spin, the eccentricity of the system, system orientation, luminosity, distance, and of course, we can infer rates of compact binary coalescences, and which is important for stellar evolution. And um, if we use the electromagnetism and, and particles to follow up, then we can infer um, things about the energy of the the associated event. We can say things about the magnetic field. Uh, we can get a much more precise sky localization. We can, thanks to that, look uh, at the host galaxy and the environment in which the phenomenon happened. We can estimate the redshift of the localization. And we can do nuclear astrophysics. So it's a whole wealth of information associated with the gravitational wave event that we wouldn't be able to do which is a gravitational uh, way observation only. So um, both combined essentially uh, can give us uh, the GRB uh, uh, that happened associated with the event, uh, can uh, let us infer things about the geometry of the system. Uh, we can look at emission models, the birth and evolution of compact objects, understand the origin of heavy elements, probe the equation of the state of neutron stars which is a very important problem in nuclear astrophysics and in nuclear physics in general. And it's interesting, after the detection of GW170817, uh, how many people doing nuclear physics got really interested in astrophysics and it started uh, following uh, up this result. And one important thing is because the chirp mass from gravitational waves encodes the luminosity distance um, if you get an electromagnetic observation, uh, you can identify a, a, a host galaxy, uh, measure redshift, and essentially you can do measurements of the Hubble constant. And this is extremely important because it's uh, really independent of the cosmic leather uh, method used uh, like by the supernovae 1A and the TIFIs and other type of um, standard candles or uh, the Planck or other type of missions that look at the cosmic microwave background and infer properties about the, the 
the spectrum distribution of the energy at uh, those early times. So one of the most interesting things to follow up is what is called a kilonova. And a kilonova essentially is something like this. You have the two neutron stars, they collide. There's a rupture, a tidal rupture of uh, one of the stars, or maybe both. And, and there's some uh, matter that is uh, being ejected and accretion this is formed almost immediately after the merger uh, um, jet of uh, GRBs is produced and then eventually as uh, the material ejected is very rich in neutrons um, and encounters uh, um, the uh, interstellar medium uh, and, uh, and this induces uh, uh, a decay of the elements that were produced by uh, neutron fusion in, in this cocoon. And, um, and that gives uh, an electromagnetic uh, uh, afterglow that can peak in the, in the red or in the blue. Actually, there were several different um, models with uh, speculating different results. So it's, it's interesting to see what actually happened. So actually, this could be seen as uh, what is called a kilonova. Um, so the interesting thing is uh, that we didn't know at the time if, if there, there is a production of very heavy lanthanides, which means very heavy elements that have a lot of electrons in, 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 in their atoms, that generates a lot of opacity and the event uh, it's going to be uh, not as bright as one would like. And, um, but the typical energy that is released in these events is about 10 to the 40 uh, hertz per second. Uh, it's going to last very few days, so it's going to be short. This is very different from a supernova, for example, that has uh, orders of magnitude that are three or four times. So, sorry, say it again. Two months before when? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I presented, yeah, I had to, to give a workshop <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah, and I gave it uh, at that time. But, but actually, this is a model made by, um, you know, if you look at this, it's met uh, and, and Berger. Uh, produced this cartoon in a paper in 2012. So this is well before it was going to happen. So that's the reason why I think it's interesting to show it because uh, this was the model that people were expecting to get. So it's, it's extremely interesting. And at that point, it was totally speculative. Nobody really have ever seen something like this. And... Um, Actually, the closest thing that was seen in, in 2013, it was a very short uh, GRB um, that was followed up by the Hubble telescope with uh, one of the cameras, and actually in the infrared, and you can see that the glow, so it's almost nothing here, and the glow uh, is just, uh, I believe it was one day afterwards. And, uh, but, uh, there were no gravitational waves associated with the event, so we didn't know, we don't know if this was produced a binary neutron star merger, although most likely for everything that we understand and now we have observed, that was a binary neutron star merger. So the missing link uh, between the merger of two neutron stars and gravitational waves, electromagnetic radiation was, was an important thing. Um, and the gravitational wave detectors may see the gravitational wave signature it's going to have high uncertainty of location of the source, as I already said, and the telescope has the advantage that it can be pointed to location in the sky. So finding the two signals at the same time or close in time, it could provide us uh, much richer astrophysical information than just the information provided by one of the instruments alone. So um, we have originally these this two instruments. Uh, and, and then um, during 03, th 
they worked during you know, 01 and very well uh, joined later, but at, at the 02 um, observational campaign that took place in uh, mostly in 2017, um, Virgo joined pretty much at the end. Currently now we're going through the 03 that started in April and the three detectors are, are working. And eventually they're gonna be joined by a detector that is similar to LIGO, uh, the LIGO detectors, it's, it's identical. It's gonna be located in India, it's, it's called Indigo. And um, um, Japanese collaboration is putting Kagura online probably very soon and much sooner than Indigo. So the interesting thing was, this actually is, is a bit old paper. Uh, it's from the 2016. And you can see um, that um, the estimated rates of detection for 2016 was very wide. It, it, it go from almost zero to up to 20 in, in those uh, six months. In 2017, 2018 was just slightly double that. Actually, we got only one event. And, uh, but it's gonna be increasing as, uh, as we reach the science sensitivity. So looking at, at the bananas that define these localization uh, probabilities, we can see how it was in 2016-17. They're getting a bit smaller in 2017-18 uh, with the three detectors uh, functioning and um, then um, reaching 160 megaparsecs in 2019, uh, it's, it's gonna be a little bit more precise, but finally, if we get, for example, indigo in the network, uh, the bananas really get very uh, tiny, much smaller. And, and that's where there is uh, a good reason to have several detectors in the network. And uh, I know for a long time, there's been a talk about having one in the south, the Australians try, uh, they might be trying again, and, and some people are uh, looking for uh, some partnerships with South America to have uh, one of these detectors uh, in, in South America. Uh, would. At some point I used to show a slide, I, I, I couldn't find it quickly today, with um, estimations like this put in a detector in Argentina. That was at the time there was uh, an Argentine group in LIGO and, and the Argentines tried to, to get some funding, but it was too expensive, so it finally didn't happen. And it's interesting how a detector in the south could really help the network in, in minimizing this, uh, the uncertainty in this localization. So the follow-up scheme to do multi-measure astronomy is the following. The gravitation of a detector identify a candidate, and this is done automatically, and automatically is signal in principle it's going to be sent. It's going to be sent. Um, this provides a sky localization. It goes through the validation process. And um, that means that humans are, are going to examine the candidate and be sure that it's worth sending it to the community. And then it's provide as a, a circular. And the circular is done using something that was used previously by, and is still being used by the Gamma Ray Coordinate Network. And actually this stands for Gamma Ray Coordinate Network that you see there. And they provide a sky map and then uh, the astronomers follow up. Um, so I want to briefly describe what um, I've personally been involved with in, in following up. So we develop a collaboration um, around 2013 and then involved people from the USA, my institution, and Texas A&M as well, people in Argentina from the Astronomical Observatory of Cordoba um, that also get time on target of opportunity time in Gemini South, and the astronomers from uh, the, the main, uh, the largest uh, astronomical observatory in Argentina is in Casleo, and then people in Mexi Mexico, people in, in, in Chile in, at both these institutions. So we, we had a, um, a, a meeting of the collaboration, the workshop, we call it the first hour of workshop in 2013. And essentially our goal was to develop an astronomical observatory in this place 
we know that Argentina is in the map. So we can put Argentina here in the map and look at the plate. So this is uh, almost 1,000 miles from Buenos Aires. That's the capital city of the province of Salta. But then you have almost 400 kilometers to the south. This is extremely isolated. It's uh, 4,650 meters uh, above the sea level. And it has a sink comparable to the ones that the Chilean observatory have here. Uh, the place is called Gordon Macon, and it's near the second largest salt flats in the world. Uh, second or third? Well, one of the biggest salt la flats. I think. This is, you can see, 25 kilometers, but this is from 150 kilometers. It's a huge salt flat, which are very good for the wind that comes from the west because it makes a lamina as it goes uh, up the Andes Mountains. And um, so the elevation, um, I said, is, is uh, uh, 4,650. This is, to give you an idea, uh, almost 500 meters higher than Mauna Kea, which is one of the highest astronomical observatories on the planet. Uh, very low luminic pollution. You can see it's even better than in, in the Chilean side. And uh, the uh, seeing is, is very good. So the seeing is what astronomers use. Uh, you know, anything below one is pretty good. And actually it gets to uh, 0.5 uh, many times throughout the year. And uh, the reason why we started thinking about this place is because the, the site, the quality of this site was discovered by the Europeans, the European Southern Observatory, when they're looking for candidates for an extreme large telescope. And one of the candidates was precisely Macon. The problem is that the logistic here is almost impossible. There is no, the nearest town is 200 kilometers away and, uh, and it's very isolated with no facilities of any kind. And uh, probably that's one of the reasons why having much better logistic um, uh, DLT decided to go look at, at pretty much the same latitude but on the Chilean side, Cerro de Macone. So life there could be pretty miserable, except for these guys. The vicuñas can actually live at that height. Uh, you also have uh, flamingos. And this is an Inca mummy that was found very, very close to, to our site, uh, 500 years old. I, I put it here because it gives you an idea of how dry this place is. So they're preserved over centuries because of how dry. These are not made in the, the Egyptian way. You know, they have these chemical procedures to keep the mummies. This is just uh, out of cold and, and dry air, uh, kept itself for the longest. And um, we call it Taurus because uh, when I first had the idea of putting something there that wasn't as expensive as ELT, that's going to be billions of dollars. This is, you know, the cost is of the order of a million dollars. Uh, so uh, the first advice I got that you had to put a nice acronym to it, and then you need to get a website. So I did both things. And the acronym was Transient Optical Robotic Observatory of the South, uh, which is uh, the plural of bull in Spanish. And so the idea is to put a telescope. Uh, the most important thing are these two. It has a field of view of nine square degrees. Remember that I was talking about the localization area of um, the uh, LIGO-Virgo LIGO candidate being of the order of a square degree. So a telescope like this can sweep the uh, probability area probably in one night and uh, with a chance of, of finding something without any particular uh, targeting. And uh, of course, the idea is to have a very good CCD, um, and this is the most expensive part of the target, $330,000. Um, it is uh, nine microns per pixel. So uh, the optical corrector uh, replaced the standard specs of the, of the telescope to make possible the, the, this nine square degrees of field of view. And, uh, and the important thing is, interesting enough, um, at the site, there's also another project, a joint project between the Argentine astronomers and the Brazilian astronomers. 
So this stands for Argentine Brazil Astronomy. And the project consists in putting this telescope that is already being manufactured in Europe, the 1.2 uh, telescope. It's going to have an infrared camera. At that high, you can do infrared astronomy. And it's going to go inside this dome that's already been built. This is uh, the place where the control room uh, for the facility is going to be at, at a small village that is 1,000 meters below. Um, and you had to go through a winding road down the mountain about 25 kilometers to get to this place, although the line of sight from the site to the place is only nine kilometers. And this is the dome and the scope, uh, the telescope for Toros, which are already in Argentina. Um, the dome it should have been, so the, all the uh, civil uh, facilities should have been built uh, by now. The problem is that the winter started early in Macomb, and uh, so we couldn't we couldn't pour concrete because we risk uh, having it uh, being cracked. So this is going to be finished at the beginning of uh, this spring. And the total collaboration participated in this uh, event, and I want to describe a little bit because this is with the advanced light or advanced view uh, observatories. It's the first. Uh, serious attempt at electromagnetic follow-up. I shouldn't say serious attempt, that sounds bad. Because there were serious attempts also during uh, initial LIGO in 2010, and they were pretty good. Uh, a lot of in, the, in the paper were published doing optical follow-up um, during uh, S6. But of course, as you know, S6, there were no alerts. Uh, because there were no, uh, except for a blind ejection, that happened at the time, there were uh, no detections. So this one was very important because it's detections were expected, and there was a whole protocol, LIGO data and VIGO data wasn't public, wasn't shared during the first observational campaign. So astronomers that were interested had to sign a memorandum of understanding to get access to the data and develop their pipelines to be able to do this follow-up. So, <coughs> and there was a circular associated with the first gravitational wave detection that went out, and we follow up. And essentially, um, the localization area was covered 100 degrees in gamma rays by the Fermi satellite, and uh, I believe the European satellite participated as well, and 90% uh, in X-ray satellites, and only 50% in optical. And um, so, this was the localization probability map of the first event. So it's more than 1,000 square degrees. It was in the southern hemisphere near the large Magellanic cloud. And um, so the only possible strategy, if you didn't have, even have any good instrument, was uh, uh, this is the, the groups of uh, astronomers that participated. There were only 25, but we were there. Um, you know, we participated. Here we are. In, in that first uh, attempt. And uh, so these are uh, the names of some of the, the groups that participating in, in the first observation. And well, this is some of the data that was achieved. I don't think it's all that important. So let me just uh, mention, uh, because I think it's relevant to mention it here, because we use a telescope big telescope, one and a half meter, which is, it has a very, very narrow field of view, uh, you cannot attend to sweep the sky. It would take a month to sweep that, the localization probability uh, pool. So what we do is we go into a catalog, and we already have a pipeline developed, and a galaxy catalog. And into that galaxy catalog, we have uh, some selection filters choosing distance, choosing type of galaxies to make a priority, which galaxies, all the galaxies are going to have higher priority of having uh, more compact objects and in consequences of being host to the event. So in this red dot here are the galaxies that we follow up because there were four different sky maps given that were obtained through four different methods and none of them were coincident. Um, so this is how the, the dots are positioned uh, with respect to the, to the map. So it's a few things that we uh, learned from this attempt. And also 
the type of sky maps that are provided uh, now are much better. It's only essentially one. And uh, so the, re the result um, uh, well, this is. I, I guess uh, this is talking, I, I, I lost track now why he has his title, and I thought it was related to the previous search. Um, yeah, no, no, th this is the wrong title. This is, this is a summary of the results of the first uh, follow-ups follow during uh, the first observation of campaign O1 of LIGON video. So 30 groups were involved in electromagnetic and neutrino follow-up, and there were several circular studies. Um, 22 instruments that characterize candidates, 100 of candidates, many contaminants. So, as I said, a lot of lessons learned. Now, for O2, um, our collaboration had these telescopes that we secured by that time. So, these were target of opportunity in telescopes in this, uh, in, in the Canary Islands, big telescope in, in Mexico. Um, in La Serena in Chile, and um, another telescope uh, here, and uh, a telescope here. That actually, it, uh, it was constructed and operated by uh, Brazilian scientists, and uh, here is where uh, the TOROS uh, telescopes located. At the time, we have a, a smaller telescope at the side that participated in the work. But the main um, telescope that we used was this one, T80 South. This is the one that was uh, built uh, by Brazilian astronomers, and there is a similar T80 North. So this is a tel excuse me. Uh, I know it by T80, and actually the the main reference paper called it T80 South. Uh, Honestly, I don't know. Yeah, um, Jailson was was referring to it as a place. I did at that time. I didn't remember the name, but uh, we, you know, in the publication, the paper we published, we put it as T80, and and we refer. I mean, that's what uh, uh, you know. The first author of a paper with uh, with technical information about T80 South is Claudia Mendez, and she referred uh, that paper refers to 80 South. So may, maybe now there's. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. So that's the name of the telescope, but the name of the collaboration is, or the survey is this one. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. And we use also this other telescope in Bosque Alegre, which is a very old one from 1930s. So big telescope uh, all technology and essentially the most important event that we had to follow up was uh, GW 170A17 so August uh, 17 LIGO real collaboration detected the marriage of two neutral stars this is the first time a gravitational detection produced a visual counterpart and it was follow up using telescope it was 130 million light years away in this galaxy, NGC 4993, and with other 70 observatories this time, uh, we followed it up. Um, this has actually, a slide shows all the different observatories that participated. You can see in yellow, the gravitation away observatory, but in, in, in blue, there are all the electromagnetic uh, observatories that participated, including uh, in space. And um, the interesting thing, it was that with the GW1708, uh, 17, this one, we had three detectors, so the localization area was much smaller. That made much easier to find the event. And uh, the localization was made even better because when you superimpose of the LIGO Virgo localization probability, the Fermi satellite localization probability, the overlap is a much smaller region. So essentially, um, this is uh, 
probably the fir very first detection uh, on, on the first day made by the Schwab, Schwab telescope. You can see the Rainier galaxy here, this is a galaxy. Um, this is um, the BLT is, is, is another uh, observatory, but this is several days later, so it disappeared. And this is our um, uh, observation. You can see here, it's almost um, covered by the, the light of the galaxy. And this was taken by the GAD uh, South telescope. So there was a very fast evolution. If you uh, read here, you can see uh, the time in, in days. So about the, the detection happened uh, just 12 hours uh, after the, the gravitational wave detection. And it evolved in this way. You can see one, two, three, four. So it starts being uh, a little bit bluish and goes red, and then it goes away by uh, day number 10 is, is gone. So it, it, it fades away pretty fast, and, and that makes it very different. It's a transient that is very different to any other transients in the sky. It changes color very fast. You can see in blue, you barely see, but here is in red. So this is August 17, four days later, it changed from blue to red. And um, well, these are some details of uh, the, 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 the follow-up. And um, this probably, let me go into some details about the photometry. And this is our own photometry, uh, where we did the, the P PSF photometry for all the sources, um, generating mass of frames, and one of the most important things that we did to get a very good estimate of the background is to subtract the galaxy. It, it, that's not an easy task because you have to do it very, very carefully. And um, in subtracting the galaxy, since this is the original image, this is now subtracting the galaxy. You can see the kilonova very clearly there. And um, so, we combined the data that was only one day. So the interesting enough, and, and this is part of the lesson to learn, uh, you know, to play this game. It's, it's, it's an exciting game to play. Um, you need to be quick, and it's hard to be quick. And, but not only you have to be quick, you have to be smart. So it's extremely hard to be both quick and smart. And, um, and we weren't smart enough because we were very conservative in the way we were calculating the time at which, so the basically the way our collaboration works, which is similar to the way other collaborations uh, of astronomers work, is we get the, the GCN notice from LIGO Virgo. Immediately, it's automatically, by a pipeline that we created, identifying the pixels in the, in the it's actually, it's almost like, like a fit, which is a standard uh, format in imaging for astronomers uh, of the localization area. And it goes to automatically to a gravitational wave catalog. We are now using the Glade catalog. We used to use the white catalog in the past, but it's more complete, the Glade catalog. And in that catalog, we choose galaxies. And now, in this pipeline, depending on the instruments that our collaboration is using, knowing the location of the observatory, is sending the targets to be follow up. Now, we were very conservative in how to follow up because we were starting at, at the twilight, of course, but uh, thinking that um, we, we should pick up coordinates in such a way that we were on the safe side, so we weren't observing during daylight. If you observe in daylight, you're not going to see anything. But we were so conservative that we missed by just a little bit the, the actual localization of the candidate. So th we, we observed it on the second day. On the third day for the T80 South, uh, Cerro Tololo was cloudy. We didn't get data for the second day. So we got it from the Bosque Alegre telescope. But that's not a very good telescope. It's big. And um, in and it, 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 the type of camera it has 
it, it doesn't let uh, you do very good photometry. So somehow th we managed to do a very interesting uh, photometry work. These are the values that we obtain in three different bands, GR and I band, so different colors. And uh, that was the, the time series photometry that we obtained. This shows the evolution of the light curve. Um, and essentially, for the T80, we can see how in just, you know, a, a couple of hours that we have observation, how the ugly is fading, in, in uh, particularly faster in the blue, not as fast in the red. And, um, and then we complement this with photometry from the Bosque Alegre telescope. The end result was um, essentially these points and these points, and we can extrapolate this curve. Sorry, so these are the points that we actually got. This blue curve actually is a model from Tanaka uh, and collaborators of Kilanovi that predicts a bluer emission at the beginning. And this is constrained actually by several factors that I'll try to talk about uh, later. So it's interesting to see that uh, at least although we obtained a few points, we, we got closer to this uh, predicted curve. And this other predicted curve then depends on, on different uh, models. So um, essentially what we did is it was consistent with uh, a blue kilonova. But the other possibility, and I'm going to be talking about it, is, is what is called a red kilonova or macronova. So, that was what we observed, and it was, was observed by many others, even better than, than we had. And um, what I want to talk about is about one year of further observations afterwards and some of the astrophysics conclusions that we can have of GW17 and YSEM. You know, this event was still being observed one year after because radio emissions can last for almost a year. So you heard the chirp here. Note at the peak of uh, gamma rays. It's 1.7 seconds after the chirp. This is interesting from a physical point of view. What is interesting is the Fermi detected independently from LIGO radio. So they weren't, uh, it's 1.7 seconds, so <laughs> they couldn't get an alarm. But, but this is really cool because uh, this was almost like the God-given event. It was in our backyard. It was strong. It was observed in all possible bands. It's hard to imagine a better beginning for multi radio astronomy than observing an event like this. And um, this is an animation that I think is, is, is good to uh, look at because it shows some of the characteristics that m many astrophysicists believe the event has. So you have the, the two neutron stars getting closer and closer. And there's the jet, and notice what happens here. This, so this is very soon after the merging, the jet. And uh, yeah. Well, that that's one of the things in question. Uh, I exactly, what is what is the exactly the, the inclination of, of the jet. And, and I, I'm going to mention a couple of things about that. Because, well, uh, let, let me, I'm going to go to there. But this is how it keeps going. So it keeps going now in, in, in the ejection of, of material. And here is where heavier elements are formed. They decay very quickly. And they have this cocoon of radiation. But as you can see, it looks very anisotropic. It doesn't look isotropic at all. 
So this, this is precisely one of the things that is um, good to take a look at. So um, that was the localization uh, probability, and it was produced you know, a good five hours after this. So the timeline, let me do a, a quick review, was the neutron star merger. You have the short DRD, 1.7 seconds. Uh, took about five hours to have uh, a good sky localization. That's that's probably a lot of time. But there were big, there were problems with uh, the LIGO Livingstone. And the LIGO Livingstone, the right at the time of the signal, there was a particular uh, abrupt uh, glitch that was stronger than the signal itself. And it took a while until it figured, um, people figured out how to remove it and um, and, and being able to uh, confirm uh, detection. So then you have the optical, uh, well, first ultraviolet, optical, uh, near infrared, um, and about 10 hours afterwards. And, and then nine days after you have X-ray emission, and then a radio afterglow that goes, started after 16 days and went on for a year. So the observable of the event. And here's where um, the astrophysical aspects of this are interesting. It turns out that when you have neutron stars, it's not as easy as having black holes. Black holes, you know, it's like a spherical cow. It's they point particles. Essentially, except for the event horizon, you can treat them as point particles. And um, in the case of neutron stars, you have extensions, and not only you have extensions, uh, after all, they're very compact objects, but they're going to be tidal disruptions, which means they're going to affect the shape of the wave. And um, so in order to get some results, you had to use some model to um, uh, extract information from the data obtained. So these models are essentially different models that are, um, you know, have um, this, this one is defective one body. This is called Taylor S2, and uh, this is Desire S2. And all these were tried. And essentially, what they do is, depending on these models, they give um, a, a ratio of a spins between the objects that could be on the low side or could be on the high side. The interesting thing is just using all these models and try to constrain what we were serving. Um, depending on, on the spin ratios. You know, um, the good thing is uh, how long it was in the, in the LIGO Virgo band, um, the event. So it went from 23 to 2048 uh, hertz in about more than two seconds. So, you know, several, several cycles uh, that we had. And essentially with high spin, the constraint is between one to 1.81 solar masses for the mass of the neutron stars. And if you take uh, the lower spin here, it goes between 1.16 and 1.6 solar masses. What is interesting then is the masses are consistent with the masses of all the known neutron stars. Um, the other thing is estimating the tidal deformability because this is essentially we're looking at super dense matter here. And um, so again, depending on the uh, reach of the spins, uh, the tidal deformability is given in terms of this parameter that is called the lab index number. So the lab index number is a number that was used um, in the early 20th century to model the, the tides on the Earth. So essentially, uh, describe the deformability on the tides of uh, a rigid body. Or if you want, to give you some of the elasticity that it can have. So it's, it's, it's a lab number and the radius of the neutron star and the mass of the neutron star. So this is essentially a, a parameter that quantifies the deformability of, of the neutron star. And so these are uh, the different rates that, that we get for the neutron star. And, um, but all we can say is that both were neutron stars, which is interesting. So, because one of them could be a small black hole. So, but both of them are neutron stars. Now, what we cannot say is what is the post-merger remnant. 
we don't know if it was either a neutron star, that might have an RPG or uh, uh, around, or if it was open, or if it was um, a black hole. And um, one of the main reasons what we can now say that is because if we were able to uh, detect very well detailed ring down, which is the last stage of the merger. Then with the ring down, um, that happens around six kilohertz, um, then we would have been able to say, well, this is a black hole because it's a typical ring down for a black hole. But at this frequency that is very high, then the LIGO radio sensitivity is extremely low. So it's not very sensitive at this high frequency. Um, so uh, we cannot infer if the result was uh, a black hole um, or a neutron star, uh, clearly. There is no evidence of submerged signals, but uh, we cannot rule a short or long-lived neutron star, and even a supermassive neutron star. So regarding the electromagnetic non-thermal emission, um, the short gamma reverse is both consistent with a neutron star a black hole or a neutron star neutron star. And that's the one thing that we can say. But um, the one interesting thing is that seems to be a subluminous gamma ray burst is much less energetic than other short GRBs. And so it's either subluminous event for some reason or it's classical short GRB, the view of X's. We really don't know, although I think there's some papers um, that after um, the collaboration paper claim that they, they consider that if it's um, of X's and how much, with some modeling, assume. So there were X-ray and radio emissions, nine or 16 days after the mergers, and the observation are consistent with an off axis afterglow from the GRB. And we explained the low luminosity of the uh, gamma ray burst and the lack of an uh, early afterglow in the mission. And so, again, could it, this be the first uh, GRB observed off axis? Uh, again, we don't know. And one of the interesting things is that there was. Uh, slow chromatic flux rate until after 150 days in pretty much all these bands. And so this sort of rules out as an axis jet. And, um, but in terms of the radial or angular structure, we know that there are two models that could predict the same thing. So we can have a mildly relativistic isotopy Kaplan. So it's a, it's a choke jet that doesn't really let you uh, come out. Or it's a really uh, truly successful structure jet of axis. And yeah. Well, it has to do with uh, the way um, the, so essentially if if this was um, isotropic, you were supposed to be seeing this because it's related to the size of the uh, of the uh, of the leftovers of the uh, of the merger, and um, in particular the radio analysis that has been pretty thorough because it was taken over. Um, I believe it was 150, yeah, 150 days. Um, it's, it's much better to, to determine pre precisely uh, this. No, what, 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 I'm, what I'm talking about is, is now trying to discern between this. Uh, oh, 
then the, the, when was this paper published? Huh? No, 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 when, when? In February. Oh. So I, I, I'm not aware of that one. And uh, so 150 days after the marriage of days of gay phase, so the uh, multi-wavelength likers per se cannot choose between the isotropic or the J. But um, if um, people have been doing radio high resolution imaging, they see a structure J, has a larger displacement, a smaller size than the isotropic mildly relativistic outflow. Maybe, you, well, maybe we're talking about the same thing. Um, yeah, oh yeah, well this is, yeah, this is 2018. So, and, and essentially, Obviously, they, they, they saw this, but this, they, they, that will be consistent with this result. And um, so, what um, the very long baseline interferometry in radio observed is that there's a superluminal proper motion of the radio counterpart that is offset from the original position 75 and 200 days after the post merger. And the size essentially is about um, between 2.7. In three or 2.4 uh, microseconds of arc. Uh, micro, yeah. And um, so this is put in some constraints. There were even observations 200 days later. Um, this is the cocoon at 30 degrees, the structure jet model, the cocoon at 45 degrees. And um, so, in terms of the size constraints, they essentially ruling out that they isotropic and predict the proper motion because in, in the case of a nearly isotropic mild relativistic outflow, it predicts a motion close to zero and the size is going to be three, uh, at least larger than three um, uh, micro arc seconds after uh, the six months, uh, many arc seconds after the six months of expansion. So essentially um, what should have happened is a relativistic, energetic, and narrowly collimated jet that should have come out of a uh, binary neutral star merger, and, and that would be consistent with the radio observation at uh, this time. Yeah, and I think a year after, after, after the merger. So the structure jet would I have about uh, 3 point uh, degrees, energetic core, time to 52 hertz, and seen under a median angle of about 15 degrees. So going to the thermal emission, um, the m there were basically two uh, big models about uh, kilonovas and micronovas, and that depend on essentially um, uh, the how how predominant we are what I call nuclear R processes, rapid processes. Uh, those don't happen in regular stars. Um, can be seen in nuclear reactors uh, on Earth, but. Uh, that's the reason why you can manufacture very heavy elements uh, here in the lab, um, but are not seen in, in, in regular stars. But they do happen in supernovae, and, and they were long speculated that they happen in uh, binary neutral star mergers, and they could be uh, the source of uh, some of the heavy elements that we see uh, in the universe in our solar system as well. So, again, the idea is that we have this disk that is a dynamical outflow of the merger, a relativistic jet, and it's, it's, it's a cocoon, sort of a tidal tail eject uh, where we have uh, in our process uh, this uh, nucleosynthesis of heavy nuclei. They decay radioactively uh, from the heavy elements that are short-lived, and that gives rise to uh, an infrared uh, pretty much ready signal. That was one of the most prevalent uh, models for many years. But the other possibility is you have short heated ejecta, compression disk with a green outflow, um, which has some uh, secular ejecta. They're going to be weak interactive, neutrino absorption, electropositron capture. It's going to be a higher electron fraction. Um, you know, the electron fraction is essentially the number of neutrons uh, over the number of ions, or if you want, the number of neutrons plus protons. So if it's um, smaller than half, that means that you have. 
a lot of neutrons, but you don't have that many neutrons and you have a high energy fraction. So there's uh, not, at least not that much nuclear physics for heavy elements, lower opacity, and that essentially uh, gives rise to a blue optical transfer as opposed to the reddish one, and it's, it's, it's really brief. So the geometry of the ejecta, uh, essentially in the case of a red macronova, is going to be like this, I'm bound by hydrodynamic interaction and gravitational torques. If you are tracing this matter, I'm bound by viscous and nuclear heating. And in the case of the blue macronova model, you're going to have the mass, these are the neutron star contact interface. It's going to be ejected by the pulsation of remnant. And uh, you're going to have this winds with neutrino absorption or uh, magnetic or large wind. It's going to pitch uh, one two day after the merger. Um, these are the light curves that were obtained um, for the kilonova. And this is a paper that actually added up all the observations from all the uh, astronomers. And, um, and according to this, you have uh, uh, about, in, in, the, in, the, in the bluer regions, about, um, you know, point uh, O2, two, two hundredths of uh, the solar mass ejected with a speed that is, you know, a little bit less than a third of the speed of light. And in, in red, it's much smaller mass with a much uh, lower velocity. And uh, this is pretty much showing uh, it's the combination of ESO and uh, DLT and HQD. Um, there's the brightness and the different, uh, the, the whole spectrum in the higher energy. You know, so this, you, you can see the time for each curve here. So, Jake the mass then from this, uh, combining all this data, is to see going, is um, about 0.05 solar mass is between 2 and 3 on one side. The velocity, it can be as high as, as a third of the speed of light. So the data reveal signatures really are to decay of our process uh, nuclear synthesis and the binary neutron star merge design for heavy elements. So this shows what we was expected or predicted that heavy elements are produced uh, during neutron star merger. And um, so I already referred a little bit to nuclear synthesis and, and how this uh, happens. And you can see the lanthanides uh, here. And uh, compared with the extruded data, you can see how uh, the particular spectrum in the production and production of lanthanides somehow matches the data from extruded data. So we, we have seen the production of heavy elements. So there's a clear evidence of our process is happening in Kilonova. And um, there is clearly a multi-component emission, and this is showing uh, uh, the, the time evolution and uh, the different uh, curves that you, you can get. And a model that more or less uh, would uh, explain this is if this is a line of sight, this is a the electron fracture, which is essentially, as I said, the, the, the ratio of uh, neutron stars over the neutron stars plus proton. And so in case that is very high, it's going to happen here. So there's no production of uh, our, uh, our process here, but it's going to happen um, in, in this area and, and particularly in this area. And these are the speeds that you see for these different regions. So I, I wanted to put here because this is it's, it's a nice uh, table of elements. I think there are some, you know, this is a bit evolving because it depends on, on different models of production. But essentially, it's telling you, you know, there are only two elements that are produced uh, in the Big Bang, maybe a little bit of lithium as well, but only a little bit. But clearly, hydrogen and most helium were produced in the Big Bang. Um, then there's not much more produced uh, 
after nuclear synthesis in uh, a lot of the uh, light elements in, in the table of elements are produced in stars. And, um, but after you, you go to heavier and heavier elements, you're going to see that they're producing neutron stars nowadays. By the way, these are in gray because actually these are unstable elements. You can only obtain them in the lab. So they're not, they don't exist in the universe. They go to dust. Um, what is interesting is that um, beryllium and borum are mostly produced through cosmic ray fission, which is essentially cosmic ray uh, fission uh, 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 light element. Uh, in, in that's the way they are produced, the beryllium and the bottom. They're not producing nuclear synthesis. They're not producing the stars. Yeah. As supernova, it's uh, it, the, the massive stars is, is a supernova. So that's what it means by massive stars. Is they collapse. So there's a lot of fundamental physics and cosmology that can be extracted from here. So from the 1.74 seconds delay between the um, gravitational wave and the gamma ray burst, uh, we can make an estimate of uh, the speed uh, of the gravitational wave. So the gravitational waves propagate at the speed of light within one to over 10 to the 15, so it's, it's a pretty uh, good, precise measurement uh, of how close is the speed of gravitational waves to the speed of light. And um, so from the point of view of, uh, of gravitation, alternative theories, gravity, and cosmology constrain the speed of uh, gravitational waves to this value is ruling out a lot of modified gravity models uh, like this one uh, quoted here. One of the most important uh, things is um, the fact that this provides, um, you know, a, a, a kilonova, so the simultaneous observation of gravitational waves and establishing the host galaxy, being able to measure the redshift, um, provides an independent way of estimating to have a constant. And that's the reason why gravitational waves um, from um, binary compact uh, mergers are called standard sirens. Typically, the stars that have a very clear phenomenon indicating its intrinsic absolute magnitude, so intrinsic energy, and now they are when they first emerge. They were called standard candles. Those are CFIT, supernovae uh, 1A, and they're extremely useful to calculate distances because, um, you know, typically the way um, Ancient astronomers calculate the distances using the phenomenon of parallax, just waiting six months and observing another star, looking at the angle subtended, uh, knowing the baseline uh, of the distance our sun, calculate the angle. But this is only true and good for, you know, very nearby. We can go very far with that. So findings like the CFI stars and um, in, in other type of stars that, for, for example, uh, the CFIs have the period, so if you're saying the light curve, you're going to see how the, the period of variation of the light of these variable stars, the variable stars, um, is actually a function of the, their intrinsic luminosity. So you're measuring the apparent luminosity, and you're measuring the absolute luminosity because you infer it from the light curve, then you get from there, you extrapolate the actual distance to the object. And um, so all these type of objects, the CFITs, type one uh, supernovae, actually the people, the, the group uh, of astronomers working in this uh, created a collaboration that's called SHOES. And SHOES obtain a value of a Hubble constant. Actually they are, uh, by now, I, th I think it's just two months ago, they published their newest result, where they're showing um, even a more, uh, a smaller error. So this, essentially this one shows the error, but this is being smaller now in the shoes analysis and um, for the Hubble constant, which is about 74 um, 
kilometer per second per megaparsec. Then uh, an alternate way of measuring is looking at the variation of the energy spectrum in the cosmic microwave background that was done by Planck, and they get a value that is about 0.67 uh, kilometer per second. And um, well, the uh, LIGO vehicle collaboration using gravitational waves with the data provided by several astronomers, uh, we, we were able to get this value for the Hubble constant. And that happened happily to be right in the middle. So it was a tremendous error and uh, to seven um, kilometers per second per megaparsec. But you can see that the, the error band is, is, is quite big. Now, these errors can go down as we have many more detections of binary neutrons and neurons. So what is truly important and good about this is, is even another method on, um, to determine the Hubble constant. It, it, there's a lot of arguing between cosmologists about the nature of the measurements by Planck and, and the Schultz collaboration, why they don't get the same value. Well, in principle, they're measuring different things. And now, of course, they argue that what one of them are measuring, which include the periodic uh, acoustic oscillations, and the others, the collaboration are measuring, are extremely model dependent, um, which is, again, a matter of uh, arguing. And, but at least this one in particular uh, is, is going to be a separate way of measuring the, the Hubble constant. And from that point of view, I think it's, it's a lot to be learned, um, although probably it's going to take several years until we uh, can come up with a number for the Hubble constant that is comparable to um, Hubble. But definitely this is one of the biggest enigmas at this time in cosmology. Yeah. And... Um, there are some constraints that the multi-message observation puts on the equation of space of uh, neutron stars. And so this is the, 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 the limit is that they put on the um, uh, tidal deformability of neutron stars. And uh, this is related uh, itself to um, you know, the state of nuclear matter at this density, for which is still a lot to, to investigate it and learn. So, in principle, electromagnetic observation exclude what I call very soft equations of space. And um, there is a constraint on, on the uh, radio um, and, and the maximum mass, so the, the, the Sohmann Oppenheimer Volkov uh, mass that neutron star can have before undergoing collapse. And um, so, this, this is also some interesting astrophysical results in that sense. And, um, and um, from uh, here is, is an example of, of uh, why and how all this uh, are put. So these are different papers that appear, some of them um, using some priors from uh, uh, radio galaxy doubling neutron star, single pole stuff. But, um, this, this is also exciting from the point of view of astrophysicists. And uh, so, in summary, uh, there is a lot that, that we learn and we can study with this type of uh, event in relativistic astrophysics. Um, we learn a lot about radioactive power transients um, and nuclear synthesis and enrichment of the universe, uh, nuclear matter physics at this uh, tremendous pressure in cosmology and compact object formation and evolution. So uh, this is uh, a you know, schedule of uh, the third observation on run for LIGO that started on video, that started just uh, in April. And it has started. And so I think we are ready for new discoveries. And I'm going to end.